Welcome to Retroality TV Presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, we present part two of Chris's interview with actress Diane Kay. Also, more insights into your subconscious with our very own dream weaver, Yvonne Reba. And now, introducing your host, Chris Mann. Thank you, Linda Kay, our vintage-voiced announcer and producer, and thank you, our bionic-eared listeners, for cutting through all of the Kardashianized media static and tuning in to reimagine that, the refreshingly real, and we hope entertaining and enlightening, behind-the-scenes podcast where pop culture meets forward thought. It's November 30th, and if you're like me, you have no idea where this month went, let alone this year. When everyone was going all Black Friday and Cyber Monday, or as one of my Facebook friends called it, Cyborg Monday, the 11th month of 2011 just got sucked into a vortex of autumnal holiday hell, never to be seen again, much like ABC's re-envisioned Charlie's Angels, which, like NBC's reimagined Bionic Woman, will no doubt go down in history as one of TV's most regrettable turkeys. Seriously, did anyone see the final episodes that ABC burned off this month? Maybe someone at the network got smart and stuffed Minka Kelly, Hod Bosley, and the rest of this rebooted mess inside a turducken. Because really, that's the last place any of us wants to look. Maybe CBS will have better luck with its Bewitched remake. Or NBC with its Monsters and Wise Guy reboots. Or TNT with its Dallas revival. If the sudden demise of NBC's Playboy Club and ABC's, in all likelihood, soon-to-be-canceled Pan Am, are any indication, people aren't as fascinated with recreating the 60s as they used to be. So ABC might want to get footloose and look into resurrecting one of its 80s domestic hits. I totally smell a rebooted Mr. Belvedere. Even if the late, great Christopher Hewitt were still alive, you know ABC would go all hot Belvedere on us and instead cast Jennifer Love Hewitt in the title role. America's favorite butler is back, and you won't believe what's been retooled on a very special Mr. Belvedere. Speaking of ABC and cruel teasing, I have to speak out about the network dumping daytime institutions All My Children and One Life to Live, both of which recently seem to be given a second chance at life, only to be dumped again by the production company that planned to revive them next year online. Perhaps it was naive of Prospect Park to think they could resuscitate these iconic shows by producing them as web series. Sadly, the financing, due in part to Guild regulations, just wasn't there, despite the company's apparent efforts to fund this costly enterprise. It's a shame that the pieces didn't come together, but while folks are upset with Prospect Park for bursting their soap bubble, I think history will hold ABC, and specifically daytime executive Brian Franz, accountable for the premature killing off of these TV institutions. Yes, television is a business, and yes, cheesy talk shows are considerably less expensive to air, but someone on the network level should have stood up for these soaps not only because they have such rich histories with legacy characters and beloved actors, I've never known a world without Susan Lucci and Erica Kane, but even more so because these shows marked an important place in pop culture storytelling traditions. Every day for four plus decades, these soaps, under the helm of their legendary 83-year-old creator, Agnes Nixon, transported people to fantastic worlds with intricate layers of backstory that weaved themselves not only through the generations of characters on screen, but also through generations of Americans who shared this viewing experience with their own children, parents, and grandparents. Some of my earliest and fondest memories of my late grandma were watching her, watching Erica Kane, foolishly sass her own mother, Mona Kane. And even though I only caught all my children occasionally since high school and college, I knew I could turn it on and instantly reconnect with its 41-year history and my own 30-something history. A few years ago, I came across an old-school pencil box from second grade that had somehow survived over the last 30 years in storage. I opened it up and saw that inside the box I'd scrawled in crayon two things. Beans don't burn in the kitchen. My lyrics challenged homage to the Jeffersons. 
And I hate Ray Gardner in crayon. A nod to AMC's original villain and father to Tad Martin and Jenny Gardner, for those of you in the know. The yin and the yang of life. Beans burning in the kitchen and hating Ray Gardner. I remember writing the latter after watching episodes where he terrorized AMC's saintly Ruth Martin, played by the late great Mary Fickett, who sadly died of Alzheimer's days before AMC's final episode uh, aired in September. That's strange. When I found this hysterical scrawling a few years ago, I laughed so hard I cried. I would tell my friends this story and then say, I know, I'm sad. But now, with all of Agnes Nixon's children passing, well, we're all sad. By the way, if you want to read a great book about Agnes and AMC, check out Dan Wakefield's 1976 tome, All Her Children. Great early behind-the-scenes stuff. These shows didn't have to die, and ABC didn't have to abandon these institutions. Yes, the economics have changed considerably in the post-OJ world of real-life as seen on TV drama. Surprise, a Kardashian was in part responsible for that televised farce, too, the OJ trial. But ABC should have gone above and beyond in adapting to these changes in an effort to honor not only the shows, and namely their durable, amazing creator, Miss Nixon. Hello, ABC Daytime built its success and identity on that woman's back, but also the audience's brand loyalty. Cutting these shows to a half hour and thus trimming the budget appropriately could have saved them while new platforms, including Prospect's proposed online network, were given appropriate time to find funding and footing. Brian Franz could have been a hero in this situation, if not a visionary who demonstrated both an understanding of the importance of preserving TV history and consumer loyalty, as well as business savvy about new media and new compelling ways to tell story through the proven Agnes Nixon franchise that has decades of nonstop built-in recognition. Seriously, all of these networks are mining these retro primetime shows in hopes of squeezing new life out of them. But they can't even try to successfully reimagine their own decades old and still kicking daytime dramas? What's wrong with this picture? Agnes says she has more story to tell and hopes someone will pull through with the money to make this telling possible. Oprah, are you listening? Lady O has already reinvented the soap with her brand of celebrity docu-series, The O'Neills and Finding Sarah, with Fergie being her marquee shows this summer. But while these reality sopras are ambitious and at times interesting, not to mention oh-so-retroality, many people just don't relate to former Peyton Play star Ryan O'Neill's Malibu exploits. Erica Kane's Pine Valley exploits, as displayed through the Malibu Pilates sculpted Susan Lucci. Now we're talking. Oprah, you and Gail need to sit down, grab you some bonbons, and figure out a way to bring the fictional worlds of AMC and OLTL to the own canvas. A couple of half-hour sopras that infuse these iconic series with the Oprah brand of personal drama and self-empowerment. Come on, I can already see Erica on the path to enlightenment and redemption, complete with Susie Orman talkdowns and Dr. Phil smackdowns. Get it on. Oh, while these soaps and their viewers await legitimate second chances in new and or tried and true broadcast media, a couple of retro celebs have, in their own ways, contributed to revolutionizing the publishing world. Penny Marshall, of Laverne and Shirley fame, recently signed a reported $800,000 book deal with Amazon.com Inc., to publish her memoir, My Mother Was Nuts, in fall 2012. Penny's deal marks a big transition for big titles with big names, not landing at traditional print book publishers, but instead finding a new home with this online conglomerate. 
Spiritual guru Deepak Chopra also just signed a lucrative deal with Amazon, so this new trend ain't stopping anytime soon. The online retailer is now not only cutting traditional publishers out of the equation, it threatens to cut book agents out as well by offering writers the chance to publish directly. Russell Grandinetti, one of Amazon's top execs, told the New York Times that the publishing game was changing in a most significant way. Quote, the only really necessary people in the publishing process now are the writer and the reader, he said. Everyone who stands between those two has both risk and opportunity. My hope is that this competition serves to make traditional publishers up their game and offer more favorable royalties to authors, while taking ebooks to new multimedia heights. I don't want to see these publishing institutions die off. Just adapt to changing times. I'll forever be grateful to St. Martin's Press for publishing my Three's Company tell-all book, Come and Knock on Our Door, in 1998. It really was at the end of an era for, quote, unofficial, that is, non-studio slash network commissioned TV books. And St. Martin's was going out on a limb by publishing a book that was full of controversy, and thanks to amazing people like John Ritter and Joyce DeWitt, The journalistic, unvarnished truth that not only pointed fingers at the show's executive producers, who have maintained ownership of the show since its inception, but also at Suzanne Somers, who back in 96, 97, 98, was fast becoming a force in the book world with her diet books. St. Martin's paid an outside attorney a serious amount of money to go over my manuscript with a fine-tooth comb, and then they footed the bill to publish the book thank God, which I quickly pitched to E to adapt as their first true Hollywood story exclusively about the life story of a TV series. Before long, NBC jumped in the game and adapted the story as a TV movie. Ironically, all of this great publicity for my book helped create a market for this type of TV biography to be told not via book, but via television. TV networks were like, hey, These are our stories to tell, while publishers were going with legally safer, quote, unauthorized fluff books sanctioned by the networks and or production companies of various shows. I really haven't been interested in writing a less than truthful or merely surface scraping behind the scenes TV book. Instead, I chose as my follow-up to come and knock on our door a totally revealing backstage tell-all about The Price is Right. TV's most litigious and forever running series, formerly starring Hollywood's most sued and still kicking TV icon, Bob Barker. I've gotten hours and hours of amazing interviews with some of Barker's original and long running beauties, producers, and other behind the scene folk who were oddly omitted from Bob Barker's 2009 aptly titled memoir, Priceless Memories, and the show's official. 2007 book, Come On Down. With all of these exciting changes occurring in the publishing world, I'm hopeful that the proper venue will present itself for this book slash story and others to emerge, like Come and Knock on Our Door, which itself was a project a decade in the making. And I want these new projects to emerge, and I think they will when the time, and yes, the price, is right. For now, I'm just thrilled that Amazon.com is moving on this Penny Marshall memoir. According to reports, her book will cover her fight against lung and brain cancer in 2009. The tabloids, which first reported on Penny's cancer two years ago, have reported recently that her cancer has returned. We so hope they are wrong this time and send our prayers and healing thoughts to Miss Marshall, who is a true pioneer in both the TV and film industries, on and behind the camera. We also want to give a quick shout out to the late, legendary Hollywood agent manager Jay Bernstein, whose amazing story is told posthumously in his just-released memoir, Star Maker, Life as a Hollywood Publicist with Farrah, the Rat Pack, and 600 more stars who fired me. Great title. Jay, who also famously helped make Suzanne Somers a star when she landed Three's Company, died of a massive stroke five years ago. Uh, his longtime friend, Larry Cortez Ham, continued writing his book until he also died, sadly, in 2009. Another former confidant, David Rubini, finished the book, which was published in October by ECW Press. 
Jay was really something. One of Hollywood's original movers, shakers, and spinners. He granted me a great interview for my Three's Company book, and he liked it so much, he showed up at a book signing I did with several of the cast members and signed his name on a dollar bill for me complimenting my writing and research for the Three's Company book. He made a grand entrance with one of his signature jeweled walking canes and pinky rings, and then he proceeded to woo me to co-author his book with him. At the time, I was crazy busy working as an art director in Los Angeles, and I was kicking around ideas for a second book. Jay seemed also to like the fact that I was from Oklahoma. I grew up outside of Tulsa, and Jay was born in Oklahoma City. So he sent me all of these materials about him and Suzanne and Farah and the Rat Pack, and then, while continuing to flatter my work, aggressively made me an offer. He wanted a 70-30 split on all book proceeds. I was looking for something a little closer to 65-35. His unwritten manuscript, while fascinating, would require a lot of work in going beyond the spin to get to the heart of his story and reveal the human behind the Hollywood legend. So I kindly counter-offered a 60-40 split and never heard from him again. (laughs) Hilarious. Months later, not many months later, very soon thereafter, Jay was arrested for allegedly beating an unidentified 29-year-old man in the head with a flashlight at his home, according to the Associated Press. Needless to say, this then 27-year-old former Oki kept his head right in his little Hollywood apartment. Jay was arrested but never charged. Perhaps it was just another publicity stunt. Well, he got his own e-true Hollywood story soon afterwards, so there's you a happy ending, Jay. But seriously, I'm happy Jay's story is finally published. Farah was reportedly by his side when he died, and I'm sure they're both up there celebrating his posthumous publication. Speaking of Farah, some of her impassioned fans have reopened the Facebook group that was shut down this fall after Alana Stewart's attorney threatened to sue its founder-slash-moderator, Kathy Swango, with big-time lawsuits. Kathy says the group shut down because it, quote, was hacked into, threatened with legal action, and so much more. Oh my god, the drama. The drama, the drama, the drama. So Kathy took a breather, removed all of the potentially defamatory posts about Alana and her Farrah Fawcett Foundation, which according to ABC News has been under investigation by the California State Attorney General's office since early summer. And Kathy relaunched the group as Farrah Fawcett, We Want the Truth, too, the number two. I'm guessing neither Alana nor Ryan O'Neill will care much for this sequel, especially since the group has highlighted in part substantiated claims that Ryan, with Alana's participation, reimagined Farah's groundbreaking cancer documentary, A Wing and a Prayer, as his own sort of love story sequel that NBC ultimately named Farah's Story. Will this Facebook group get another legal smackdown? Will the Attorney General find any wrongdoing with the Stewart-helmed Charitable Foundation? Stay tuned. We'll keep you posted. On a couple of happier and final notes, my cover story interview with Cheryl Ladd was just published in the December issue of Wellbella magazine. Check out GNC stores nationwide, and you can also read the interview in December and thereafter on wellbella.com. And finally, I am so proud to bring you, in just a few moments, the long-awaited conclusion to my two-part Reimagine That interview with amazing Eight is Enough star turned writer and cancer survivor, Diane Kay. The always delightful Diane talks about the new comedy series she's developing, titled Seconds. Cannot wait to see that. ABC, here's your chance at post, re-envisioned Charlie's Angels Redemption as well as the fascinating psychic vision she had when she awoke suddenly last November and realized she needed to get to the doctor pronto and check her kidney. She did, and it saved her life. I'll let Diane, a wonderful storyteller in her own right, as her humorous blog at dianekproductions.com illustrates, I'll let her share the inspiring details with you in a bit. By the way, her website is D-I-A-N-N-E-K-A-Y. Productions.com. 
constituents. Then stick around after our interview because we have our insightful and deeply intuitive resident dreamweaver, Yvonne Reba, sharing some of her prophetic dreams that foretold the deaths of a friend and a relative. Most of us are not as intuitive as Yvonne, or anywhere near that, so don't worry if you dream of a loved one passing. In all likelihood, as Yvonne pointed out to me after we recorded her upcoming segment, the death is just symbolic. But we wanted to share these death dreams with you on the hills of Diane telling about her life-saving psychic vision to illustrate that any second chances we are given in life, we got to take them, appreciate them, and maximize them. I personally believe that death is just a transition to another greater spiritual realm, and I think Yvonne's prophetic dreams illustrate this. But if we're given a second chance at life as we know it, by all means, seize the day, as Diane Kay has so masterfully done. A couple of her beloved Eight is Enough co-stars, the late Lonnie O'Grady and Diana Highland, weren't so lucky. In some of her TV siblings, including the ever-childlike and all-too-vulnerable Susan Richardson, have experienced years of hardship in part because they gave over so much of their personal and considerable creative power to addiction and other excess. But every day we wake up, as long as we're alive, we have the chance to really, truly wake up. And as much as this show is a fun-loving celebration of retro pop culture, I'd really love if you left this listening experience with at least the beginning of your own spiritual awakening, or your continued reawakening, that encourages you to embrace your retro-loving, imaginative child within, and fearlessly move forward in re-envisioning your own reality and reinventing your life at age 25, 35, 45, 55 and on and on and on. If Agnes Nixon and Betty White can continually refresh themselves and keep renewing their dreams in an ever-changing world at nearly 80 and 90, respectively, then we can keep on keeping on, too. Reimagine that, indeed. And now, without further ado, let us join Diane Kay as she talks about Eight is Enough fame and some TV family tension that arose when she was cast in a would-be blockbuster feature film that gave her the golden chance to work with one of Hollywood's creative geniuses, Steven Spielberg. Stay tuned for Diane's refreshing reality with a retro twist. Fortunately, all but one of your uh, TV brood there, your siblings, are survivors through thick and thin. Going back on the show, you had mentioned that Susan had said, oh, I wish I was Nancy. (laughs) I know that back then, especially, the press would try to pit people against each other and say, oh, there are jealousies and resentments. Were there sibling rivalries there on Eight is Enough? Was that a challenge at all for any of your siblings that you recall, your TV siblings? Well... You know, it's kind of interesting. I think it was a little bit different back then as opposed to how it is now because the salaries back then were not as extreme as they are now and the media was different. It was just at a point where like Farrah Fawcett's poster was the big thing. Right. But it, at that time, merchandising wasn't quite as it is now. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so luckily, I think, in a way, and the paparazzi wasn't like it is now where yeah. you actually have to run for your life. <laughs> um, it was a lot tamer. You know, we all had a chance to do things outside of Eight is Enough, and that was good. I didn't feel any jealousies, but um, if there were some, it really didn't come out, you know, that it was a a big, big thing. Each and every one of us was so different that whatever it would be that we were asked to do would be different because it was a fit that we were supposed to do. Like, um, I think actually we were kind of happy for each other that there would be certain things that the only time that there was a little bit of a problem, and I can completely understand with when I got on um, Steven Spielberg's movie 1941. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That there was a little bit of, you know, 
Mm. Hey, why why her? Why not me? <laughs> well, and maybe so. I mean, and who wouldn't feel that way to work with Steven Spielberg? I would have been jealous too. You know, I mean, yeah. that was an amazing experience, and I was very lucky. But at the same time, maybe because it wasn't such a super hit, it, it all boiled down, and everybody was fine about it. <laughs> so Balance so was it, restored. It worked its way out. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> that was quite a big coup for you. Do you have a memory of Steven that pops in your head? Because this is one of his earlier films and really one of his, maybe his only non-commercial success. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) It was actually a success in Japan. They loved it. (laughs) (laughs) Made the Americans look so silly. (laughs) There you go. There's nothing more the Japanese like than movies about World War II. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, you, you know, this was a big coup for you. Does meeting with Steven Spielberg stand out in your mind or being directed by him? Oh, it was like, yeah, I mean, so many different images. I, oh, I could tell you so many stories. Um, one, if you saw the movie, there is a scene in the USO ballroom where they do this sort of domino effect. And the part was uh, I had to get my foot wrapped around this Christmas garland which, you know, I was supposed to walk and get this wrapped around my leg and that would trigger these chairs falling down, which would trigger a whole bunch of things happening and then this giant chandelier was supposed to fall on Treat William's head. <laughs> and it took hours to set this thing up because it was like a mouse trap, you know, it was like a domino effect and it was one of those scenes where you couldn't rehearse it because it took so long to set up and it just was like it was supposed to be, you know, you just had to do it. Well one take. A one take thing. And so it was right before we were breaking for lunch and Stephen came up to me and he said, now don't disappoint me. I want you to get this in one take. <laughs> well, that's all you had to say is don't disappoint me. And I'm yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> so, and I'm supposed to not look like, you know, I know that I have to get this thing wrapped around my leg and mm-hmm. it, it wasn't easy. I mean, it was really difficult. So um, he says, and get it before we break for lunch because, you know, we have to do this now. So <laughs> then he calls action and I try to do it and it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, no. So then he came up to me and he said, you didn't do it. And the look <laughs> on his face, oh, man, I-, I felt so bad. I went into my trailer and I prayed. I just, I was like, oh, no, how am I going to, I've got to do this when we get back. I've got to do this. If I don't do this, there again, I was going to leave the country. I was going to leave the country a lot. <laughs> But to disappoint Steven Spielberg, you don't want to do that, you know. And so I came back. But see, that was good. I was able to have that one rehearsal. I needed a rehearsal. I had yes. to feel it, you know. I had to get there. Yeah. So when I got back, they, you know, took hours to set that scene up again. But as soon as I got in, I said to the higher powers above, please, <laughs> you know, you don't leave me now. And um, <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> I got it done. We got the take. And he smiled. And then I was happy. And uh. everybody was fine. That was a lot of pressure. But another time time, this is a funny story. I was back when Farrah Fawcett had the Farrah look and her hair, and I, for some reason, I didn't like the color of my hair. Now, I'm <laughs> shooting 1941 and Ada's Enough at the same time, and silly me decides that I don't like the color of my hair, right in the middle of shooting <laughs> the movie. So, I talked to Janice Page. Janice Page was working on the show, and I liked the color of her hair. <laughs> so, I had heard about the famous Jose Ebert who did Farrah's hair, yes. and, but I didn't know exactly where he was located and I, I didn't know that much about him I just knew the name was Jose and he did her hair and I liked the color so um, Janice came on the set and I said oh Janice I love the color of your hair and I say who do you go to and she said Jose so I said great I could give me his address I'd like to go to him so she gives me this address and it's in Beverly Hills and again I'm not thinking too clearly so I go and I'm in this kind of area in Beverly Hills it wasn't like the Beverly Hills like Rodeo Drive it was sort of on the outskirts of Beverly Hills and I, I go into this little shop and I'm going, this doesn't look like Jose, but I go in, I, wa- I walk in and I go, oh, hi, um, I'm looking for Jose. And the guy says, I'm Jose. And, and I go, oh, hi, well, I'm here. Janice Page told me to come to uh, get my hair done. And he goes, okay, sit over here, you know. So I sit down in the chair and I go, well, I kind of want my hair that color, you know. And so he puts on this stuff and all of a sudden my head is burning. And I'm going, Jesus, you know, what's going on? I said, get this stuff off of me. So he's washing my hair out, he's washing my hair out. And then he turns my chair around so I can't see what's going on. And I see the looks on the faces of the people under the dryer and their mouths are 
hanging open. All of a sudden, I see clumps of hair coming down on the floor. I turn oh around gosh. and I see my hair is, it's green. <laughs> this sounds like an episode of Eight is Enough. <laughs> I had green, gray hair. I'm screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God, I got to shoot a movie, oh, my God. I ran out the door with that plastic apron on my shoulders, screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God. So then, and this is funny, if you ever see some of the eight is enough, you'll know now what was going on. I wore this denim hat practically on every scene. You see me go up the stairs with my normal hair color, and you see me come down with this denim hat that I never took (laughs) off. Um, I just wouldn't take it off because I, I was scared. Well, then I had to go to shoot 1941, and I walk on the set with the denim hat. And I didn't shoot that day, but Stephen's just staring at me. He's too (laughs) smart, you know? He's just too smart. And I'm thinking, hmm, how long can I postpone this? (laughs) And then he comes up to me, and he grabs my hat. Uh, He says, I knew it. I knew it. I'm going to kill you. (laughs) Oh, my God. So I was in the hairdresser. He was the hairdresser all day long get trying to get my hair back to the color that it was when we started shooting oh that was horrible it's just absolutely horrible anyway wow. it wasn't jose <laughs> i did finally find the real jose but that wasn't jose <laughs> Talk about a lesson learned. Although when you said you had a hat on your head, it did remind me of Jose Iber. And to be honest, I always wondered when I would see like him on the Donahue show in the 80s, and he'd always tell these women, we are giving you a complete new look. They chop their hair off. <laughs> and I'm like, why are these women putting their hair and their image and identity in the hands of a man who wears a cowboy hat all the time? <laughs> And who was bald. That's why he wore it. Oh, he had go. that long braid, but the top of his head was bald. <laughs> That's irony. That is that irony. Is irony. <laughs> Take your head, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he switches out the feather every once in a while on the hat. Oh, but... <laughs> my God. Talk about memories. Oh. Yeah. Well, there were millions of them. In fact, it was Mickey Rourke's first job as an actor. Stephen asked me to read with Mickey. It's a funny story, too. Mm. I didn't know what a Mickey Rourke was, but he came in and Stephen said, that, now, I'm going to have, I read for the part, and then he said, I'm going to have uh, this actor named Mickey Rourke come and you practice with him and then come back and read with him. Because he was up for the part of Sitarsky, which was Treat Williams' part. Um, and Mickey didn't get the part because Stephen said he was just a little bit too unpredictable. He wasn't sure how to handle him. Um, but at the time, Mickey had hair all the way down to his back. Wow. You know, he had really long, blowing hair. <laughs> he came to my apartment. I heard this roaring of a motorcycle, and I looked out of my balcony of my apartment, and I saw what Mickey Rourke was. <laughs> and I went, oh my gosh, is that what's coming upstairs? <laughs> and it, he was in my apartment for like two hours for a one-page sides to read. I thought, God, he's a very slow learner. (laughs) Can't he get these lines down? (laughs) But uh, I was, oh my gosh, I had little teacups with tea. I served him tea and he just kept looking at me laughing. He just thought I was something else. You have some interesting stories. Are you going to write your own autobiography one of these days? (laughs) Someday, (laughs) if I don't lose my memory. (laughs) It's a good thing I'm telling you these things now. Get it it down, get it recorded. Yes, good. Well, one more famous hairdo real quick. Adam Rich. As a kid, I have to say, Adam Rich, I'm a few years younger than he, always made me feel very inadequate because my hair would not do that bowl thing. Do that. <laughs> and I always resented those kids that could, because I had like wavy, kind of curly red hair. Aww. And I'm like, I resented Adam Rich. But he had kind of a crush on you, didn't he? A little bit of one? Yeah, he did. He did. I had a nickname for everybody on this show, and his name was Munch because I thought he was like a little munchkin. <laughs> so I used to call him Munch. And uh, yes, he did have a crush on me and he was adorable and I had a boyfriend at the time and he said it was okay he would share me (laughs) so um, when we did the wedding show I told him that we could secretly get married and so that when they said the vows that we would secretly be married so he believed it (laughs) and um, so we were secretly married and so during that wedding show with Abby and Tom Adam and I had a very very special that was a special episode for us very special very special have you been in touch with him because clearly he's had quite an arc in his life of Mm -hmm, his struggles. mm -hmm. You know, I I haven't talked to him recently. I mean, we've touched base now and again, but he's one of the cast members I really haven't touched base with um, recently. But I guess we're still married.
married. Maybe we are still married. <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> I better talk to him. You better look into that. <laughs> yeah, I better look into that. You don't want any polygamous charges. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> how many husbands are enough? Eight? Uh, <laughs> well, I very quickly, and then I do want to ask you about reality TV. Uh, oh, sure. Kate plus eight, and I'm the Octomom. Eight is a magic number these days. But first, in the 80s, when Eight is Enough ended, you went on and you did all of the great episodic, <laughs> iconic shows, The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, <laughs> Murder, She Wrote. What challenges did you encounter, even though you kept working, mm -hmm. when Eight is Enough ended? Because all shows do end, and then you're kind of back out auditioning. And was that a struggle mm -hmm. for you at all in the 80s? I was really lucky. I was doing a lot of pilots. They didn't all make it, but I mm -hmm. did a, a couple of series. I did a show called Reggie with Richard Mulligan and Barbara Berry and Gene Smart. Mm -hmm. It was a takeoff from Reginald Potter, which was a show in Britain, um, a BBC show, and it didn't really take off too well here in the States, but that lasted a season, I think. Uh -huh. um, and then, uh, and that was fun. I love doing comedy, and yes. so I was cast in a lot of things that had to do with comedy, and I did a show, the short-lived show called Glitter, Aaron Spelling. I remember that, Morgan yeah. Brittany. I was in that for a while, and then I did another series called Once a Hero. In fact, my ex-boyfriend directed one of them. That was funny. We had broken up, and then he ended up having to direct me. That was strange. That's <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so awkward, but he's a good director, actually. He's a very good director. Cool. Um, and, and then I did, oh, actually, Grant and I did um, a night gallery, I think it was, or dark, yeah, dark room, dark room. Oh, dark really? Room. Dark room. That was it, dark room. We had to play lovers. Uh -huh. Now, that was strange, because that was right after <laughs> it is enough, and we had a bed scene. And that was very, that felt weird. <laughs> Forget polygamy. Now we're dealing with something completely different. I know. That was very strange <laughs> to be in bed with my brother. <laughs> well, and you two were always like the big sort of sex symbols on the show. Uh, I yeah. don't know if you saw yourself as that, mm -hmm. but no. you and Grant Goody, <laughs> my sister was like, I so want to get in that van with Grant Goody. Oh, he's so, he's still adorable. <laughs> he's still good looking. And he's he really done well is. for himself. He's such a nice guy. He really is. You know, I, I hate to make everything sound so Pollyanna, but honestly, what a good group of people I got to work with. And being in other shows and other casts, I see how special that casting of Eight is Enough was because you don't always get that same feeling when you're working in a, with other casts. You don't get that. We really were. It was different. It was a special time. Wow. And I think it reflected, and I think that the audience picked up on that. I don't think you can fake true, true um, friendship. I think it comes through in, in the shows. Oh, yeah. It definitely came across. And it, that is so good to hear because so many of the headlines in the last 20 years have been because of the different struggles and controversies. Has it ever frustrated you a bit if you've received questions like, oh, is there a curse on the eight is enough? <laughs> The, the eight is enough curse. <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> you know, for a while I was thinking, my gosh, there were only two or three of you that seemed like didn't have some major health struggles in the 90s or 80s. Did that ever perplex you that all of these kids that you grew up with? That had addictions? Yeah, things? yeah. Well, I, I have to tell you, I do have an addiction. and Nobody knows about it. Yeah. You want to know what it is? Yeah. Is it antiques? It's garage sales. Oh, That's my addiction. There you go. See? Everyone has an addiction. <laughs> well, mine's a garage sale. It's the truth. And it's something that I, I will actually be going somewhere that I'm supposed to be on time. And if I see a garage sale sign, I can't. I have to stop. <laughs> and look. <laughs> I understand. And I have to, you know, admit this. I have collected so many different things over the years, TV memorabilia. I have a great big memorabilia collection of Three's Company, which, you know, I'm in recovery now. Oh, good. <laughs> but I, I have to tell I, you. I have something for you. You. Do you really? <laughs> Just to feed your addiction. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I can't wait to find out what that is. <laughs> But I, I have to tell you, a couple of months ago, I was on eBay, and somehow I came across Eight is Enough Jigsaw Puzzle. Wow. From, and I bought it mint, sealed, and I have it, you know, in my little special shelf. How, and how freaky is that? Have you ever gone to a garage sale and come across an Eight is Enough Jigsaw Puzzle or anything like that? I have something freakier than that. No, I would love to have found that. It's probably mine, because mine was stolen. Oh, no. <laughs> I oh, I have contraband. 
if uh, eight is enough contraband. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll tell you something that was really weird. You want to hear a weird, weird story? This is so weird, and it has nothing to do with eight is enough, but I have to tell you. Absolutely. Um, I, I went to a, an antique store, because I love antiques as well, and I, I was passing by the showcase, and I see this picture of this little boy and this woman, and I took a double take, and I thought, what? Is, oh, my God, that looks like my grandmother. That looks like my father. Oh, wow. And so, sure enough, I asked the person at the store, you know, if, they, if I could look at it, and I go, do you know where the vendor got this? And she said, uh, I don't know, but I can call her. And so I, I swear, this is my father in New York <laughs> back in the 20s, and this is my grandmother. So she calls the vendor up, and it turns out that she got this picture from an estate sale in Beverly Hills years ago, and it turned out Whoa. that it was my grandfather who lived in Beverly Hills, and they were breaking up his apartment, and she had this picture. So I blew it up, and I sent it Whoa. to my dad, and that was really a freaky experience. He, oh I mean, the tears gosh. coming down his eyes, but that was really strange. <laughs> so life is stranger than fiction. <laughs> it is, and it, sometimes it makes you wonder if there wasn't something guiding you to pick up that little treasure. I know. More than a coincidence, you know? I know. I know. It's very strange. It's How cool is that? Well, it if was. I, I'm, if I come across another eight is enough puzzle, I will let you know. Everyone should have one. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <laughs> It'll be my luck. There'll be one piece missing. It'll be my face. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll I'll, uh, I'll keep that one. I don't want any you know, weird, ominous, eight is enough puzzle messages. <laughs> well, antiques. I had read that when you kind of retired or stepped away from acting in the late 90s that you had focused on antiques and interior design. Was mm-hmm. that is that true when you had your son? Well, as again, as I said, I, I love garage sales and I went to an estate sale one time and uh, met this wonderful lady. And uh, being that I was kind of on hiatus, I started working with her company in Pasadena for a number of years. So I started getting involved with antiques and she had an antique store. So I learned a lot about the business of antiques and uh, loved doing estate sales because in my, probably in a different lifetime, I was an anthropologist or archaeologist. I loved, (laughs) I don't know what it is. Like uh, sometimes like if I pick up an object, I can feel the vibration and the sense of, of who owned it. And, and, wow. and for an actress, it's really kind of a neat thing, you know, to yeah. to get into other people's lives and kind of imagine what that was all about. So kind of, it works hand in hand. I, like I said, that's my addiction. It's not fattening and so it's not too bad. <laughs> you know, it could have been worse. <laughs> I am with but, you and you are not alone. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love the past. I love old things. I love old people. You know, I love history and you can learn so much from people and their lives and what was in the past. I find it intriguing. Absolutely. The history contained in items and in people is not to be undervalued, especially in this day and age where everything is about, you know, if you're 25 in Hollywood, you're over the hill. Well, it's a throwaway uh, world right now. It everything is, is yeah. just disposable, you know, and everything is a soundbite rather than having the luxury of just taking the time to listen to a melody and listen to music that had a message, you know. If my son is learning to be wired differently than I was, and everything is now fast. They, he loses his attention so quickly now because everything just moves. I mean, it's like you, you get a cell phone, and just as you learn how to use it, they've got a new one. And, <laughs> right. You know, I really, I'm not good with change. I'm just learning how to blog, and that's become my new therapy. But yeah. I, I'm not, I'm really from old school. I, I really should have been a Victorian, and, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with this century. I really am. <laughs> I am. (laughs) I'm still in the 20th. You're not alone. I mean, I'm in my late 30s and... Oh, you're ancient. (laughs) I know. I'm like, my nephews are like 23 and I'm like, you know, Methuselah to them. And I I still have a little flip phone, you know, don't have any of the fancy schmancy iPhones and and I'm still learning Twitter. Now, you mentioned your blog. We've got to mention your website. I have one, which is so odd. Tell us about that. And, and there are some humorous musings. It's oh. very funny. You, you did a thing about tattooed Barbie. Um. Oh, I was appalled. <laughs> absolutely appalled. I mean, what is this world coming to? Yes, you know, my mother spelled my name with two N's. So if you go on this website, it's Diane with two N's because there's someone else named Diane Kay and she looks like Betty Crocker. And somebody, <laughs> somebody put that picture as to where is she now and it's not me. <laughs> And I looked at this woman, and God, I thought, you know, people must really think something happened. 
uh, it's horrible. I mean, I, I don't mean to demean her. She's probably a very nice lady, but it's not me. And very I have wholesome. my name. <laughs> she just, it looks like, I, I don't know. Uh, Connie called me up and said, you've got to go on the website and see who they put as you. And I did, and I screamed. I screamed. I said, oh, my God, take her off. Take her off. <laughs> it wasn't a tattooed Betty Crocker, was it? No, it wasn't okay. a tattooed Betty. No, she's, I'm sure she's a lovely woman. It's just not me. And she has brown eyes. Besides, I have blue eyes, and her eyes are brown. So, And she spells her name with one N, and I spell mine with two. Even if you're not terribly techno-savvy, you kind of got to have the web presence so that if something like that comes up, people can at least go to your site and go, Diane Kay is still Diane Kay. She's not <laughs> Betty Crocker. <laughs> no, I'm, and I have blue eyes, not brown. And I spell my name with two N's and uh, no E on K. It's just K-A-Y. <laughs> and that's just for starters. Now, you mentioned Connie, and I want to talk to you about your amazing journey over the last 10 years and year, especially with eating cancer. But some of our listeners may know that Connie, is it Connie Newton? That was her maiden name. Her married name was Needham. Needham. She's now divorced, but I don't know if she still goes by Needham. I think she does. So for professional reasons, Connie Needham, she has mm-hmm. survived. Is it cervical? Ovarian. Ovarian. No, ovarian. Uh-huh. And how is she doing? And She's doing great. Has this brought you two together in recent times? This- yes, yes. She's very much involved with a cancer organization. She just did a fundraiser for helping. I think it was for ovarian cancer, but um, wow. she's been cancer-free for over a year now, and she's doing great and has her. a great, great philosophy and good attitude. And I think when you do go through something like that, attitude is everything. You know, it, mm-hmm. it really having a belief system of being positive positive and being able to be a fighter, um, Mm -hmm. it helps, you know, and also having a sense of humor. You got to take things a little bit less seriously because um, the way I look at life is we all have an expiration date, you know, we just don't know when that's going to be. So while we're here, you know, we need to do as much as we can and be positive and have goals in life, you know. Absolutely. And I want to ask you in a moment about how cancer has brought you to that full realization. But For our listeners who may not be completely aware of how long you dealt with this, what would become kidney cancer, did this kind of begin in 2001 with an MRI? Yes. Tell us what happened. You weren't feeling too well. Actually, it was on the day of 9-11 that I had this MRI and Mm. they found this back on my right kidney and they told me to watch it and the next year I had another MRI and it hadn't really grown so they weren't that concerned but they did say watch it and then I changed doctors and the doctor didn't really think it was anything he just thought it was some kind of a assist and it was a nondescript thing and he didn't encourage me to continue taking MRIs and so I didn't but <laughs> during that time I was not feeling well and I attributed it to being an older mom because I'd had my son when I was 44 so I thought, gosh, maybe I'm just tired, you know, because I'm just older. You right. know, and I've got a toddler and maybe this is just normal. But then I started getting some strange symptoms. I was having joint pain and I was having urinary tract infections and I was having flank pain and wow. just odd, odd, odd things that were coming and going. My particular cancer is microscopic and so it didn't show up in blood. So I would have blood tests, but it never showed up. And then I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia oh. and sometimes I think that when they don't know what else to call it, when they can't figure out what it is you have, they just lump it as fibromyalgia, Mm -hmm. which it wasn't. Because now that the tumor is gone, I don't have those symptoms anymore. Um, The other thing, too, that was really interesting was that I had this craving for sugar. I was just like sugar, 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 sugar. And after I had this tumor taken out, I don't have that same craving anymore. I don't know if there's any correlation between that, but it is an interesting thing. Um, And my cancer is sort of a rare cancer. It's only 5% of people get this particular of cancer. It's called a renal cell carcinoma of the chromophobe type. And it's a, I think it was like 1985 that they first really zeroed in on this particular type of cancer. It shows up differently than other kinds of cancers in the way that it looked. And I was just not feeling well. And again, I, I kept going to doctors and they couldn't find anything. And then finally, I was having an ultrasound for another area. I had sciatic pain. And sure enough, there was something. So um, wow. we took care of it right away. This was like last November. Is that last- Last November. Mm -hmm. Almost a year ago. It was right before Halloween 
when I found out. And wow. it takes you for a loop, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. I can't imagine. And I want to ask you this real quickly. This popped into my mind because you were talking about Connie and having a positive attitude, which both have always seemed to. I've always sort of wondered, it seems that like really nice people sometimes get cancer disproportionately. Do you feel in retrospect that we're holding things in or being too nice? I know that's kind of a weird question, but I've always wondered about people that are so kind getting these struggles. And maybe it's because on a cosmic level, that disease then teaches all of these loved ones around them some things. Hmm. But have you ever wondered about, you know, stress levels or anything Hmm. you might have gone through in your life? Yes. Yes, I think you hit on something. I don't know why I think stress does contribute it. I've always been very, very sensitive. I'm I'm overly sensitive, which is Hmm. a blessing and a curse, you know. But it's great if you're an actor because, you know, being sensitive, you can tap into a lot of emotions and things. So it's wonderful as a creative tool. But in everyday living, it's painfully hard to be super sensitive yeah. um, in some respects because you do take in a lot of other people's energies. And pe- I was laughing, I have to tell you, because you know, I, was, I was thinking about old television shows uh-huh. and I was thinking about the ones that I used to like and the ones I didn't like. And I remember Lassie. Now, this is a perfect uh. example. I could not watch Lassie because it always bothered me. I was always so stressed out that Lassie was not going to make it <laughs> and that, you know, she would be going through a fire and then at the very end you know that music that with the violins and then she lifted up her little paw you know and you just look at Lassie and you just like you wanted to hug her and you didn't want her to next week to go through it again <laughs> but that's how sensitive I was <laughs> leave Timmy in the well Lassie you've done enough I don't know it's true I mean that's I'm not telling you as a kid I mean I would worry about Lassie I worry yeah, I'm a yeah. worrier you know not a good thing but I mean I, that's how bad it was it was like oh no no Lassie you know she said oh god you know, get the show canceled I can't I can't stand it that paw you know that paw? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Maybe you don't remember the show. You're awfully young. I don't think you do. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I catch it on the Retro Network. <laughs> it was the music. I can still hear <laughs> it in the that, background that, with the violin. Yes. Oh, and, 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 and the paw, you know, that, that, that little paw. Oh, God. There's nothing that can tear a person down faster than a cute dog. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, w- would you consider yourself like, an, what do they call them, empaths or people that just make Maybe you're too empathetic, feeling other people's pains and other people's sadness. Was it to that degree with you? Yes, yes, yeah. it is. And, and, and I, I don't like it because yeah. it, it's painful. It is painful, but, you know, maybe when I get a little bit older, I can learn how to not do that so much. Yeah. Be more self-involved. That'll be good for you. (laughs) (laughs) Then everybody will hate me. (laughs) Right, right, right. You're you're darned if you do. Another interesting thing that I read, you were featured recently in Moore Magazine, is that a year ago, you say you woke up in the middle of the night and had, like, a psychic vision Mm -hmm. that pretty much ended up saving your life. Was this a dream, or was this just a total wake you up conscious thing? I've always been a very intuitive person Mm -hmm. and this is something that I try to teach my son to be and what I mean is it's that inner voice that we all have but don't always listen to Mm -hmm. and if we can tap more into our inner being and understanding what our inner voice is teaching us, we can keep from making large mistakes in life Mm -hmm. and um, this guiding force that I have when I do tap into listening to my inner strength and my inner self usually guides me into making good choices and for some reason I woke up out of a deep sleep and I woke up and sat right up out of bed and all I know is that I heard my voice say you get to the doctor tomorrow and wow. you make sure that you get this done so I feel like I've kind of been guided mm-hmm. you know I'm just it's not like I'm hearing voices or anything it's just right, an inner right. it's an inner sensibility um, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. all have free choice you know we can make decisions and I try and teach my son to listen to his voice, not always what other people want of right. him. But when something doesn't feel right and somebody says something else, but in your gut, you know, that gut instinct, mm-hmm. to trust that gut instinct. That's why there's that saying, I had a gut instinct. I had a gut feeling. Yes, that, that right. There's something to that. And once a long, long time ago, I went to a psychic years ago, mm-hmm. and she said to me, one of the biggest lessons you will learn in life is to listen to your 
self, your inner hmm. self. When you don't do that, that's when you're going to always say, I should have done it. I should have, you know, I should have had a V8. Right. You know, it's that, it, 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 it is. It's that I should have had a V8 moment, that <laughs> aha moment. And it's always guided me in the right direction. When I do that, I am always going to where I should be going. And when I don't, or I like, for instance, I listened to some doctors that told me that I was you know, imagining these things in my body that, you know, I didn't know better. And who should know better in your own body? You, you live in it. You should know how you feel. Yeah. I allowed a doctor to tell me that what I was thinking and feeling wasn't there. And there again, the psychic said, you know, when you don't listen to yourself, this is when you'll get into trouble. And so um, thank God I was able to tap into that waking up moment and hearing go to the doctor. So I listened. Wow. I listened to my voice. And again, as I said, I, if I can teach my son anything, especially as he's becoming a teenager and he'll be getting into circumstances where, you know, there's peer pressure, yep. I want him to always be secure enough in his own mind to hear my voice saying, uh, 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 listen to mm-hmm. yourself. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. That's right. I can't think of better advice, especially in this day and age with the internet and cell phones and all mm-hmm. of these messages coming at teenagers. Mm-hmm. I feel for you having a teenage son. I just, <laughs> so do I. Don't believe I, me. <laughs> I just helped raise my nephews and I'm like, thank God they're not teenagers anymore. <laughs> it's so funny because my girlfriends, you know, they all started out a lot younger. When I was doing eight is enough, they were having babies. Now their kids are having babies and I'm raising a teenager <laughs> and I'm raising a teenager as I'm going through menopause, which is, you know, oh. it, this, it's sort of kind of like what's happening with this show that I'm writing. Yeah. It, this show that I'm writing is called Seconds, and it's about mm-hmm. the second stages of life, and it's about my girlfriends and I just taking a second chance in life, and for us, like, we're all second wives, and so we're, mm-hmm. we're going through all these really weird stages and uh, battling midlife, and we all have kids, and so uh-huh. I, I say it's sort of like our old <laughs> age hormones are battling our kids raging hormones it's a, it's a really <laughs> really strange time in life and so to raise a teenager now I mean of course he thinks I'm the most stupid thing in the world and I, I don't know anything he knows everything so <laughs> he'll yeah, learn <laughs> yeah you're right you're not alone he'll learn but I also have a golden retriever puppy and mm-hmm. so I'm, I've got a, a terrible toddler puppy and a teenager so it's interesting in my house <laughs> <laughs> well I love that concept now now, have you written, is it like a sitcom pilot? Are you developing? What can you share with us? Yeah, we're developing. It's a half hour, one camera film show. And it is a parody on second stage in life. And uh, there is a twist in it. But that's the part I can't talk about because sure. uh, that's the part where, you know, when we can get this thing on the ground, then it'll all make sense. But I think yep. we've showed it to different people and we're getting positive feedback. And Good. it's just fresh, you know, it's fresh. And I think it's something that it's relative and timely right now and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to it and feel that they can have their kids watch it too at the same time but it's entertaining and kind of on the lines of the humor of like Malcolm in the Middle's humor oh, good. it's quirky but different uh, the characters are strong and they are you haven't seen these characters on television before so I'm really really excited about it I'm hoping you know one of these days somebody will be as excited about it <laughs> as I am and we can get this show on the road I am sure with the intention and the energy that you're putting into this that it's going to find the right home at the right time. I think so. I believe in timing. You know, it's all about yeah. timing. That's half of it. And I think you know, there was an article in the LA Times just this weekend about the need for family programming again. And and this is basically what it is. It's a family-based program. And I, I think there's a space for it right now. I think all these reality shows, I know you wanted yeah. to mention about yes. that, but you know, things go in cycles and I think it's time that we you get some family shows. We need it right now this, with the economy, the way it is and the yes. way uh, the future is going. And I call our show comfort food comedy. It's a comfort food. Uh-huh. And that's sort of what I remember when I was growing up is this feeling of comfort that I would come home from school and I couldn't wait for the show lineup of the week, you know, and I knew my Dick Van Dyke show, my my three sons, my bewitched, you know, I look forward to it after school. I was thinking of my shows I was going to watch that night. Now, I don't know what I would want to watch, no, you know. I-, I love that. And all of those shows you mentioned have a little or a lot of magic to them in their comedy and in the connection that the audience had to these characters and the uh, escapist value and also anytime you can share little lessons like Eight is Enough did. Do you want to blend those two things of entertaining and, 
enlightening a little bit with your concept? Yes, it's a parody. We don't take mm-hmm. ourselves too seriously. Good. Uh, I think it's important, you know, not to take yourself too seriously. But yes, there's, yeah. you know, there's messages in it. We like to say that we're comfortable in our own skin, even if it's a little looser, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and w- there's no plastic surgery with these characters. We are more authentic, but we see the humor in life as we're going through it and raising these adolescent teenagers and the things that are happening now today. You know, I mean, I just take things that happen to me in my own everyday life. I, I do carpool and the boys are with their little gadgets that they're, you know, they're playing their little games, their video games, you know, and, and here I am, I'm turning the radio on and trying to listen to my Frank Sinatra as they're turning on their music and it's all rap. And so it, I was laughing. I said, this is like the duel in um, Deliverance. I turned on the music and I hear Frank Sinatra, they get louder and then I'm hearing rap and and then we duel with who's going to outdo each other in the music and it, it, you know this is just getting to school you know yeah. but it's funny what they listen you know you can get so much out of being in the car if you want to talk to your kid uh, if you really want to listen have them listen to you you can hold them captive when they're in the car and it's the only way you can really finally get them to listen to you because they can't escape you know and point. so that's when I get my most information to my kid is through the carpool smart yeah no it's true that's the only way I can keep them out. they don't listen to you any other way so I, I get them in the car and lock the doors a captive audience yeah well you know I had mentioned eight is a magic number in TV eight is enough but in recent years we've instead had these really bad reality shows Kate plus eight and the Octo Mom. what do you think in general about reality TV especially those kind of family things and really the lack of wholesome light-hearted scripted family series in this day and age I don't think that some of these reality shows are good role models for our kids I think that they are showing an ugly side of what's going on I, grown adults shouting and using foul language to get a point across is not my idea of a role model and right. I don't really, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I just don't find that that is giving the kids any sense of value and and teaching them much. I'm a little bit overwhelmed on how many reality shows there are. I know that it's less expensive to produce, so maybe that's one of the reasons there are so many out there, but um, I think the tide is turning. I think people are getting really tired of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, it's all about celebrity. You know, I don't see the art in any of it. And I, I would like to see more. Or I think there's room for different programming. We have so many cable channels now, and there's just so much. I don't know. There doesn't seem like there's a lot of substance, you know? No, and thank goodness networks like TV Land are going back to the more traditional types of comedy with Hot in Cleveland and some of their other original programming. And, and that seems to be a trend that's spreading a little bit. I think that the whole Kardashian thing is hopefully coming to an end pretty soon. Well, you know, it's getting to a point where people go on these talk shows now and all they do is promote their perfume line or their <laughs> clothes business and yeah. it's where is the entertainment anymore you know there's no more variety shows the closest thing to the old Ed Sullivan or variety show is Dancing with the Stars and the X Factor right. that's about as close as you're going to get to the entertainment you know, like a variety type of a show where mm-hmm. people are rooting for you to do well and I miss the old you know like Carol Burnett and uh, there were some really oh, great yeah. shows back Back then, I even like black and white television. Actually, I, my kid can't even relate to it, but um, black and white TV still holds up as far as I'm concerned. I'd rather watch a black and white movie than a colored movie. Yeah, well, and sadly, black and white shows are hard to find, even on nostalgia networks. So, talking about antiques, people are missing out on a lot of good stuff. I just saw a Lucy the other day. Thank God that still plays. I love um, that show. It, it all started with Lucy. And at the very least, people need to have an appreciation for the history when they're seeing one of their favorite reality stars pretending to be real when they're stomping grapes or something. That mm-hmm. came from Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's really true. You know, it was really sad. I was talking to my son about the Marx Brothers and how funny the Marx Brothers were. And he, you know, of course, he didn't even know who the Marx Brothers were. And I'm like, oh, 
my, you know, this is terrible. <laughs> I've got to uh, educate him. Yeah. <laughs> the Marx Brothers and George Burns and Jack Benny. I, I love those shows. Like I said, I like the old. I, I think there's a lot you can learn from them. It, the comedy is just amazing. We, it's true. A lot of the shows today kind of take from them, but yeah. they, they were the originals. They were the originals, and there was an innocence and a realness there that you don't find in reality. And Eight is Enough on DVD. What's going on there? So many people are like, why isn't this show on DVD? And I think there's a movement underway now to get Warner Brothers to release it. What are your thoughts of that? And how cool would it be for at least season one to hit next year during the show's 35th anniversary? Well, it's interesting. I just found out yesterday that if you go on Amazon.com, you can actually get the first season of Eight is Enough for $1.98. Whoa, what a bargain. Wow. And it just, it, yeah, I know. I don't know exactly how it's being done. I don't know if it's like an iPod kind of thing. I'm uh-huh. saying iPod like I know what I'm talking about. I don't right, know what an iPod right. is. But, but it is, it's, if you go on Amazon.com, you can get the first season. A friend of mine just called me and told me that. Wow. And I don't know who's doing it. Shows something, something. I don't know. Uh, we'll but, so you can do that. I know that there's some shows of Eight is Enough in Italian. On my website, I have a little thing I found that there's this Italian version but Mm -hmm. it's not good if you don't speak Italian (laughs) (laughs) a little hard although I like my accent it's it's, it's good (laughs) unless you're stomping grapes I don't understand Italian (laughs) but no I don't know why it's not on DVD I think it's crazy and I think it would be very popular and I think kids would love to see it I mean we my son would look at these cars you know back in the 70s (laughs) these huge gas guzzlers and say people drove those you know (laughs) and Tom Bradford is a Typing on a typewriter. He doesn't even know what a typewriter is. That is hysterical. Yeah, that makes us all feel old. Mm-hmm. I will help get the word out because these studios need to know when there is a groundswell, and I think there is with Eight is Enough. I would love for you to start a campaign. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll do. We will Thank do. Yeah. Just one or two questions here to sort of bring it all home, so to speak. Eight is Enough often was very much about lessons learned. Learned. With surviving Hollywood and then surviving cancer and the other things you are surviving, what are the biggest lessons you've learned during your life's first and beginning of your second act? Wow. That's a big one. <laughs> that sounds like a eulogy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, what did I learn? What did I learn? I think that we are all blessed with talent when we are born and that we're here for a reason. And when we can find our passion in life and believe that there's no reason to edit yourself and stop yourself from going towards a goal, just believe that you can do it and um, don't be afraid of the fear of failure because failure is a gift. When you fail, you learn from it. When I went on auditions all the time, a lot of people would say, how can you stand the rejection? I loved it because I learned every time I would go on an audition that this was a lesson. What did I do and how could I make it better? What can I learn from this? And every time I did go on audition and I didn't get the part, I learned what I should do next. So actually failure is not a bad word. It's a learning Tool. So take that chance of having a goal, go for it. Don't be dissuaded from not getting the first bite that you ever, you know, go after. You have to keep trying. You have to keep trying and not give up. And it's the same way with cancer. You know, having a positive attitude and not giving up can get you a longer chance in living. And yes. laughter, laugh, 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 because if you don't take things quite so seriously, things aren't that bad. Really, they aren't. You know, we can get through anything, even this economy. We can get through <laughs> anything. There, there is abundance and we just have to believe it. We don't have to buy into that we are lacking of anything or that we don't yes. have enough. We have enough. We just have to learn how to be creative and get what we want. And, um, you know, just keep trying. Don't give up. Don't give up. So well said. Your life, just like it is enough, is a dramedy, but you got to have the comedy as part of the drama. Always keep that humorous point of view. It will help you survive <laughs> many things. <laughs> And if not, you know, uh, <laughs> well, turn on the television. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, watch Lassie and feel sad. <laughs> <laughs>
You'll forget your own troubles. One, one last question, Diane, and thank you so much for your time here. Oh, my pleasure. It's my been pleasure. so great to catch up with you and help share your amazing journey with uh, listeners. One thing you told More Magazine that I thought was really cool was that, and I hope I'm not misquoting you, but that your cancer battle pretty much taught you that we are the navigators of our lives. How did you come to this philosophy? And with what you've gone through with cancer, something that many people think, oh my God, it's something I can't control and I don't know what I'm going to do. How did this defining moment in your life help you? It makes you? you stronger. It teaches you who you are. You know, it, it's, I mean, it's not for sissies, you know. Mm-hmm. You find out real quickly who your friends are and who, where your support system is. But it also taught me my strengths I didn't realize I had. And that was a major uh, wake-up call for me is that I realized that you got to walk your talk. It's not about just talking about doing things. It's really about going out and doing them. And we, as I said before, we have an expiration date. All of us do. We just don't know when it is. So why waste the time you have? Go out and, and make something out of your life. Don't sit around thinking about it. Go out and do it. And even if it doesn't happen tomorrow, keep going, keep going. The people that are successful in life are the people that don't give up. They're the people that say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep on trying. And they go and they keep trying until they figure it out how to get there. But you'll get the same result. If you do nothing, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you keep on trying, there's a strong chance you'll get what you need. And to always have goals, you know, have a goal and, and make it a game. Make it a game. Make life a game. I think my favorite song is Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Mm-hmm. And it really those words. Life is but a dream. So make your dream heaven on earth. So well said. Those are words to live by. And we're very happy that you are living well and doing well. And we can't wait to see what the rest of your second act, you're only just the beginning of it, will, mm-hmm. will bring to us, including your sitcom. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much. I hope we can talk again sometime. I would love that. Please keep me posted and we will keep listeners posted on your uh, successes. Thank you so much, Chris. I really enjoyed meeting you, even though I I, I don't have a face. I like your voice. (laughs) Thank you. Well, same here. And thank you again, Diane. And I'll be looking out for that. Eight is enough puzzle for you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Take care. Hope to see you at a garage sale. (laughs) I'll be looking for you. (laughs) Okay. Bye-bye. Yes, life is but a dream, and as long as we have Diane Kay in it, it's going to be a good dream. We thank her so much again for her enlightening and really inspirational words. This gal has survived a lot and really knows how to embrace life and embrace opportunity and embrace challenge and turn it into something good. So... Until next time, Diane, thanks once again for delivering a plate of homemade wishes on our kitchen window sill. And speaking of dreams, we have now our resident dream weaver, Yvonne Reba, here to talk to us about some very special prophetic dreams she had years ago that foretold the deaths of a couple of people in her life. These dreams are unusual because Yvonne is exceptionally intuitive, but I think they reaffirm that there is another dimension out there that dreams are a spiritual connection that we have to the divine and to the otherworldly. And hopefully these dreams will bring comfort to those who need a little bit of that confirmation, especially at this time of year. Of course, most dreams where we think we have dreamt about someone's impending death turn out just to be symbolic dreams that really mean more about ourselves probably 
probably than anyone else in our lives. But in this instance, Yvonne really did pick up on something that was about to happen. So once again, we join her and learn so much about the dream world. And if you want to learn more about Yvonne, check out her website at YvonneReba.com. That's Y-V-O-N-N-E-R-Y-B-A dot com. And now we join Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you, Chris. Oh, fantastic. Well, we're thrilled to have you back. We've learned so much from you about the dream world. And I'm really curious, what do you have for us this week? Well, this week, I have two dreams of my own that I actually dreamed. Mm. Warnings about the death of somebody close to me. So, prophetic dreams that had a real-world result. Absolutely, yes. You might want to call them premonitions, or but they weren't they were warnings by the people i believe that in each case one was my cousin vincent and the other was a friend of many years of both my husband and myself and his wife was also a great friend and still is as a matter of fact uh of gary and both of them gave me a dream in which they told me that they were going to to pass over oh wow well tell us about the first one you said that is my cousin he's my first cousin yes his name was vincent he came from the, my father's side. He was on the, on the Welsh side, you know, my father's brother. Uh, and Vincent was older than I was. And at the time of this dream, Vincent was in his mid-70s. And he had slowed down greatly because he had emphysema. In fact, he couldn't take the winters in England, so he got himself a little place in the south of Spain. And he'd go over there for the winters and take his oxygen and whatever, you know, get his oxygen there. He had to have oxygen to breathe. Now, when he was a young guy, he was very active and he was always traveling and doing things. I mean, this was somebody who was on the move mm-hmm. and, and he had lots of adventures. I mean, Vincent had a, it was not a boring life, let me put it that way. Uh, yeah. I had written to Vincent saying we were going to be coming over to uh, England and give me some directions on how to get to your house, you know, when we, we arrived. And that was going to be a few months, you know, and so on. And we corresponded, but we didn't do it every week. We might get one every month or so, letter between us. So at that particular point in our lives, I was thinking I was going to see Vincent again. Mm -hmm. And then I had this dream. And this dream was at the beginning of July, I think, or the end of June in this year. And I found myself in this dream, in this beautiful, but very old, like um, a tea room type of place. Mm -hmm. A kind of 1700s type of um, gourmet food store, if you like, Mm -hmm. with things like onions and peppers and all sorts of wonderful foods hanging in bunches on from the ceiling and on hooks. There were beautiful glass jars filled with fruit, candied fruit in some cases. There were piles of beautiful fruits everywhere and there was this enormous board. It was about six foot long and on it laid out was this huge smoked salmon in the shape of a fish and it you know smoked salmon expensive you get it in little pieces you know you don't get the whole salmon and especially not a great big one like that so i'm looking at that and vincent is beside me but he's 20 something again oh, he's wow. uh, got the black hair again he, you know he's gray and going bald but here he is young and vital again and full of joy and, and energy, and he looked terrific. And I am standing there, and I look down, and I'm holding this very large white plate. And on this white plate, there are four enormous blackberries set in, like, a square, right? Four corners of, you know, a square. That's kind of odd. And I looked at them thinking, what on earth am I doing with this plate? And Vincent said, come on, let's go. And he <sighs> ran up to this fish, this great big smoked salmon, and he got scooped a great big handful right out of the middle of it and ran towards the door of this heavily timbered, very old types of sort of gourmet food store, like a coffee shop sort of thing. The the door had one of those old-fashioned bells on it, so when he opened it, it made a big ding-ling-a-ling type of thing. (laughs) And I shouted, no, you have to pay for things. And he said, no, you don't, it's free. (sighs) And he ran out of the door and shouted, come on to me again. But I'm thinking, no, I can't go, I've got... What the heck are these blackberries? I've got to pay for them. And I turned to the counter, and behind the counter, big old wood oak kind of, you know, counter top, there is this shape, and it's a kind of wispy, white, vague, cloud-like shape. And I 
thought at the time in the dream, I know it sounds weird, but I thought it looks a bit like Casper the ghost. <laughs> the friendly ghost. I know, and this was, you know, and this is how dreams are. They have all sorts of ludicrous things in them. Uh-huh. The only thing you could really see were two eyes looking at me. And although this shape, which was kind of wavering in the wind, as it were, wasn't any wind, but it looked like it was wavering, didn't speak, it said in telepathy to me, it is free. Mm. I said, it's free? I was so amazed. I was absolutely overjoyed as well because I was in this place where everything was free. And I ran to this fish and I scooped a great big handful out of it too. And then I woke up. So I knew I woke up and I thought, well, I have never dreamed of my cousin in all the years that I'd known him. I can't ever think of a dream when I've had Vincent in it. But here he is showing up loud and, you know, flashy and very clear and so on full of life and I belonged to a group at that point an Edgar Casey study group and they're all over the country by the way and they're wonderful places to make friends and find out other metaphysical people of all kinds of thinking mm-hmm. and we always did a dream discussion and so on the Friday of that week I went and I told everybody about this dream so it was documented that I'd had it and Edgar Casey was known as the sleeping prophet right yes that's right. So dreams were a big, big thing for him. Absolutely. Yes, he a huge books about things that Edgar Cayce talked about, and dreams were definitely one of them, and he would explain what dreams meant to people. Mm. And I've learned quite a lot about dreams from reading what he'd written. Absolutely. So, yes, and of course, discussing them with this group was a, another wonderful way of finding out how dreams work. Mm-hmm. So I told them all about this dream, and then I had this letter from Vincent saying, well, it's going to be fun when you come, we'll get to see each other, and so on and so on. And then the next week, I had a letter from his sister. And his sister wrote and told me that she was very sorry to have to tell me that her brother had died. And he died on July the 4th, Mm. which was four days. I had got this dream had appeared in my mind four days before he died. Oh, wow. Well, then it all clicked into place because I couldn't figure out the blackberries. I really couldn't figure them out. I figured out that Vincent was looking forward to passing over. I mean, I got that part. Mm-hmm. He was young again. He was vital, full of energy, and and he was going. He was leaving. Mm-hmm. And he left through a door that I didn't go through. And I get this in my dreams when people are sending me messages about passing over. But there is a door involved at some place because many times in uh, explanation of what death is, you'll get that it's just a doorway that you go through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you, you find yourself in a totally different place, but it's just a door. So I looked at my dream. I'd written it down. I made a note about when he died, and I went through it. So we're, we're in a place in life, which is like a gourmet food store. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful place. And now this ancient part of it is probably because we were both born in in that part of the country and we were very sort of like a traditional old-fashioned style of living in many parts of that country still people don't move around they tend to stay in the one place they don't move house very much um not like in this country where people are very well mobile and they can switch from one state to another that doesn't happen very often in england right it's a little bit more so now but nothing as mobile as it is over here where people well i've got friends who are just coming back from one state to live in Houston this weekend. Almost nomadic. <laughs> so, yes, very. So here Vincent was going through the door. He took a big handful of this fish. Now the fish is, one, it's food. It's very expensive food. Let's consider it a luxury, all right? But it was free. Life will offer you the most wonderful things. It's up to you to take it. That's what the dream was saying. Vincent said, I'm going to take a handful. I'm going to have what I want, and it's free. And he did live his life like that, as a matter of fact. He lived his life to the fullest. And even though he died of emphysema, his whole life had been one huge adventure. And even with the emphysema, he managed to get himself to Spain every year and enjoy himself in a foreign country. That was part of what I got. But then this figure behind the counter that told me that everything was free and it was there for the taking. And that figure, there wasn't anything spooky or scary about that figure? No, in fact, it was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's something to watch for in dreams, that you will get the sense of humor Mm. popping up. You know, I say God has a wonderful sense of humor <laughs> because we have one, right? We have senses of humor. So God must have given it to us. Obviously, just like the DNA that our parents give us, we get right. all these traits from the creative spirit. And like I always point out, you know, it's, you've got to be pretty evolved to have a sense of humor. You know, that you don't see the, the ants on the ground don't have a sense of humor. They just, <laughs> you know, the way they are. Right. But you can God will have a sense of humor. Oh, yeah. They are closely attached to us and they've adopted some of our traits as well. But they 
catch on to what's going on. They, they know when you're making a joke. Absolutely. This Casper the ghost was the Holy Spirit or the Holy mm-hmm. Ghost, if you like. And when I figured that out, I laughed. I thought, well, that is ridiculous because it didn't look at all like the awesome thing we are supposed to feel the Holy Ghost is. Right. right? You know, there was no flames. There was no booming voice. There was no <laughs> thunder and lightning going off. It was nothing like Charlton Heston and when Moses, you know, met God. None of that. <laughs> it was just this kind of funny type of figure that said, it is free. And that was serious. That part was serious. Mm. And I said, it's free. And I went and had a scoop of this beautiful fish too. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling full of joy and happiness. And then when I got the whole story that, you know, he'd passed over, I knew he was happy. I knew he was looking forward to it. I knew he was very thrilled with the idea of getting out of that body that was no good to him anymore. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. Absolutely. In retrospect, that is, I think, comforting to know that you had that moment with, I guess, his spirit. I I had a dream. My great uncle who was like a grandfather to me had been ill in the hospital for several weeks but he was starting to get better we thought he was going to recover and come home in fact my mom and I were going to go see him over the weekend and that Friday night Saturday morning I had a dream that I was a kind of accompanying an old man I didn't really see his face but I was accompanying him kind of along this pathway in this canyon it was almost like the Grand Canyon and my grandma was there who had passed on a few years earlier and her presence was very potent in the dream and Mm. then this older gentleman and I walked up to this like little bridge across the canyon and there was a guy at the bridge who let the old man by but then stood in front of me and said no you can't come Ah. Um, well then Mm. when I woke up I was so overwhelmed with this feeling of my grandma I felt like I had this visit from my grandma but the other part of the dream with this old man was definitely sticking with me and I was trying to figure it out. An hour or two later, when I woke up and was making my coffee, and my mom's cousin called his daughter. He had passed away during the night. And I was like, whoa. So I'm kind of curious. Do you think I had just a psychic tap in that he was crossing over? Or was I in another realm in kind of, quote, real time, accompanying him to this bridge, this tunnel, this doorway, and to another place where I wasn't allowed to go? Is there two ways of looking at that? Yes, there are two ways. You're right. Um, You were close to your uncle? He was like a grandfather to me, yes. That's right, yeah. So my feeling on this, that there are different ways of looking at this. Sometimes we're given a warning. But in your case, I feel that your uncle wanted you to know that he was very close to you and he wanted you to know that he was going on. He was passing on. And in doing that, he sent you this dream which explained the whole thing. I'm going across a bridge and in this canyon, you are not allowed to go. He is crossing the abyss, in other words. Mm -hmm. And that's a great symbol for moving over to the other side, Mm. a place where it's the unknown country. All right. It's a mysterious land. You know, the ancients believed they crossed a river, mm-hmm. you know, that they had to get on the boat, the, the river sticks, and the boatman would take them over and so on. And the, only those who were passing over could get in the boat, of course. Mm-hmm. So you, your uncle was doing that. He was going, and he used this wonderful imagery. He's crossing the bridge, but you can't. It was quite majestic. <laughs> yes, wonderful. And he was saying, you know, this is a huge, imposing place. You won't be able to see what the other side is like, really. Mm-hmm. I will get to see it, but you won't. But you will eventually, when you cross your bridge, uh, as we all do. And there's nothing to be frightened about. This is this is a wonderful experience. Wow. I know it's scary because it's like going to the dentist, you know. Everybody, you have to go to the dentist, but nobody wants to go. But it's the same kind of a feeling, you know. But we needn't be fearful of it. It's something that... It's not the blotting out of everything. You do not lose your individuality. You, yeah. God made us individual. And God did not make us individual so that we'd all become one amorphous mass eventually. All right? Mm-hmm. The individuality apparently is something very special to the creative spirit, to God, mm-hmm. who created the whole universe. And every part of it has so many different parts to it that's infinite that um, we can't even take it in. Our imagination is just like, well, we can take so much and that's as much as we can grasp it this point. Yes. Great dream though. And so we've been visited by spirit and in your case the spirit of your cousin visited you before he had departed. You have another dream kind of like that? Yes I do. 
Yes, and I picked this other one because there were similar things in the dream. Now, Gary was a friend of my husband's to begin with. They had worked together. And then I met Gary and his wife, and so the four of us became great friends. Gary had moved to another state and asked my husband to come across and help him on this particular job. My husband was an artist and did special work, special finishes and things too. So we had moved across the state just for this one job as a matter of fact. We were there just over a year and then we moved away again. Wow. But when we got around the country that way, that's for sure. <laughs> Gary had phoned my husband up and said that he had cancer and he really needed Temperley to come and help him. My husband was called Temperley. And so we did that and he was doing well. I mean, he kept going for treatment and he did well. And that thing started to shrink, tumors shrank or disappeared, but then they popped up somewhere else. And Temple and I decided to go to England for um, a couple of weeks in the November of that year. And my birthday is in November. So I was thinking, oh, well, I'll get to have my birthday in England again, for, which I haven't done for a long time. Right. And I was a few days away from going when I had this dream. And in the dream, I was in bed exactly as I was in real life. I mean, it was the same room, same bed, everything was the same. And I woke up in the dream, all right? This is, I know this is really strange to have this kind of a dream mm -hmm. where you're in bed waking up. And I woke up and I realized that it wasn't my husband beside me, but it was my mother, but she was asleep. Mm. And my mother lived in England, all right? So that's, we were going to see her too. At that point, the wall and the bed was right up against the wall. Through the wall stepped a man. Now, that's a bit of a shock. I got really shocked in this dream. Mm -hmm. This man stepped through the wall, walked past me, didn't look at me, didn't say anything. Just walked past me and turned to the left and went through the door. Now, the bedroom door was closed in the dream, but he walked straight through it. I recognized him as Gary. He was wearing white painter's dungarees, whatever you call them, right? Sort of kind of with the braces, you know, the sort of pockets and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And he loved to wear those. That's what he wore at work. He had a painting contracting business, and he liked to wear those. He had a whole bunch of them. But... This particular time, not only was he wearing that, but he was wearing a little white hat on his head, a round hat. It looked a bit like a bowler. Mm. It wasn't made of felt or anything. It looked much lighter than that. And that's what I remembered. And anyway, I woke in my dream. I woke up my mother and said, Gary has just walked through the wall and that door. And this means he's going to die when we're in England. Oh, wow. This was within the dream. Yeah, weird. Oh. I woke up in reality then, really woke up, and woke my husband up, okay, and said, I've had this very weird dream in which Gary walks through the wall <laughs> and through the door, and my mom is there, and I said, and I think he's going to pass over when we go to England. Wow. Now, at that point, we didn't know when he was going to pass over. He kept, like I said, he would reverse back again. He'd get better and then he'd go back again. But he wasn't doing too well at this point, obviously. So we went to England. We landed on my birthday and we found out the next day that Gary died on that day. He died the day that we landed. Oh, wow. And his wife phoned us up and let us know the next day. And they had the funeral, of course, while we were away. And Gary and his wife were Mormons. And I knew something about, you know, Latter-day Saints as, as they are mm -hmm. and so on. But there was some stuff, obviously, I didn't know. When we got back from our vacation and we saw Gary's wife, I told her about my dream, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, he was wearing the usual stuff that he normally wore at work, you know, these white dungarees, and she had given me a program from the memorial service, and here he was looking at me, smiling from the picture, and wearing the same stuff I'd seen him in, the white dungarees. Oh, I said, wow. well, that's what he was wearing, but he had a funny hat on. And she said, oh, that would be his temple hat. His temple hat. His yeah, temple hat. Apparently, a moment have um, their temple clothes, are all white, they're all white, which is interesting that he picked to wear the white outfit, um, but a working outfit. Because mm -hmm. he was a working guy, he loved what he did, he really did. But he wore his temple hat. Wasn't that interesting? And I had no Very clue that he had a temple hat, nor what it looked like, around, and I described it, and she said, that's exactly what they look like. I'll so I was, wow, you know, my mother represented England. She was in bed with me. She represented us going to England and, mm -hmm. and being there when he passed over. And he walked through the door that was closed, mm -hmm. but not to him. It was open to him, but it was closed to me. There you go. So there's that symbol again. There's that symbol again. It's a very interesting dream. And he knew that he was going. But at that point, he was still with us. But part of him, the spiritual part, in which we all have, was fully aware that this body was going to be wearing out shortly, and he was going to be free. And he was going to walk through that door. He was going to walk it. He couldn't walk very well at that point. He was like Vincent. He was going to be vigorous again. He was going to be full of energy. He was going to be fit and he was going to do what he wanted to do. And he did.
did. And it's so interesting that you mentioned this dream about your friend, Gary, and that he had cancer. For this episode, we've interviewed uh, actress Diane Kay, who was on the big hit series in the 70s and 80s in the United States, Eight is Enough. And mm. she talks about how, about this time last year, November of 2010, she was woken up and she woke up to a psychic vision in the middle of the night telling her to check her kidney. Years prior, she had had x-rays and tests that showed a spot on her kidney. And at the time, they said it's no big deal, but let's just keep monitoring this. She had had all these symptoms, and wow. she had monitored it to a point, but I guess she had not kept up as much as she had and over the years, and she woke up to this vision, check your kidney. She went into the doctor. They found out that the kidney had a, a major tumor, cancer, and she Whoa. needed to have surgery. Well, she had that kidney taken out very quickly, and it saved her life. So this waking psychic vision saved her life. I'm kind of curious, do you feel that that was part of her subconscious that maybe pushed her out of a dream about that and made it very much part of her conscious thought? How do you see that connection between that and then a dream with a spiritual aspect? Well, you're right. A spiritual aspect. Those are the big words there. Mm -hmm. We are spirits in a body. We are created by the universal creator, created the universe, everything in it. And it's not ending, it's infinite. And that's beyond our scope of understanding, certainly beyond mine. But we know that it's so, and we know that we're part of it. And I believe that because God created us all, that we have part of, if you want to call it the spark of God, that's our spirit, our soul within us. And it is there to guide us and help us. Now, a lot of us kind of lose track of it. But in dreams, we're often connected again. Not just in dreams. But it comes at other moments, too. It will come as an inspiration sometimes and so on. But in this particular dream with Diane, her spirit was fully aware that she had a lot to do still. And it wasn't her time to go. And so it gave her a very clear message, which obviously gave her such a, a shock that she went straight off and had it fixed. Yeah. I mean, she didn't hang around for a few months and think, oh, shall I do it or shall I not? She went and she had herself looked at and they operated on her immediately. And I think that's wonderful. Her spirit was definitely connecting with her. So to me, that would be uh, the spiritual aspect would be showing up through the dream for her. Mm -hmm. It can be your subconscious, too. I mean, I think the subconscious is part of all this. The subconscious often will notice things that you don't notice in the daytime, as it were. Right. The subconscious will say, did you notice that there was something strange about the way the car was operating? But you were so busy <laughs> listening to the radio or mm -hmm. talking on the phone or whatever that you didn't notice, but your subconscious noticed. I might give you a dream about that. And so you should go and have a look at it and see if the brakes are okay or if there's something about to fall off, you know, on the car. Yeah. Because that often is what happens. And that's not so much, I mean, I think of that as still a spiritual aspect, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a very sort of practical way of fixing the problem, too. Your subconscious saying, hey, get up there and fix the tire before it goes. But here we have this wonderful dream from Diane. I think that's terrific. Great dream. It saved her life. And, you know, the spiritual realm of dreams, I'm very much a beginner in, as a student of this whole world of dreams. In addition to talking to you, recently I picked up a book that I found at a thrift store, Dream Work for the Soul by Rosemary mm. Ellen. And Guiley, I think you pronounce her name that way, from 1998. And she talks about how the ancients viewed dreams as divine gifts and that dreams occupied a bridge world. There's that bridge thing again. Yeah. A, a world of imagination that spanned the world of matter and the world of spirits. Do you agree with that? That kind of echoes what you've been saying. Yes, I do. And this book probably tells you, I know I've read books that tell us that the ancients, and we're covering the whole world here, not just ancient Greek mm -hmm. or ancient Egyptian or whatever, but the, the Mayan, you know, yes. the... Um, Babylonian. <laughs> yes, everybody. I mean, all these ancients, and some are not so ancient, they're still doing it today. They believe that inspiration is sent to us through our dreams, that we are given some kind of a hit or a hint 
or a clue or whatever about something, and it gets us going. Mm -hmm. People have dreamed whole books almost, and, you know, the fact that Robert Louis Stevenson dreamt the plot for, um, you know, The Wicked Mr. Hyde, you know, oh, the split really? personality mm -hmm. with, uh, oh, gosh, I've forgotten what the other part was, the... Um, Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that's it. Mm -hmm. He said he dreamt that. Mm -hmm. He said he woke up with this weird dream in which a man was able to change his personality by weeding away all of the um, sort of the evil. But the evil then took on its own shape in the, the Mr. Hyde part, and so he wrote this great book, which, my goodness, how many movies have they made of that? Wow. You know, it's still going. Sure. This was an inspiration that came to me, said he did not, was nothing that he thought about before. And that's happened with many, many people. They have been inspired to invent something, Absolutely. to write wonderful music, to write books. Uh, paint pictures, come up with some wonderful device that saves us all a lot of trouble or hassle or, or whatever. Now, the sewing machine was partly, not the whole thing, but the, and I'll talk about this in another uh, time when we have more time. Yes. But that, how the sewing machine was able to work came to this man in a dream because they were having a great deal of trouble with that. But he figured it out in this very strange kind of funny dream. And other things, too. In fact, one of the Beatles, Paul McCartney, said that one of his songs was given to him in a dream. I love it. And we'll talk about that another time, too. Well, there's obviously a world, greater source, a higher power that we are tapping into when we have these moments of genius or these moments mm. of revelation, inspiration, save your life do this this is more than the brain that we have in our waking time so it, it must be divine it must be otherworldly that we're tapping into that spiritual aspect of our, our greater selves i agree with you because you know i'm a practitioner in the science of mind and mm -hmm. there you go the mind we believe that everything comes from the mind we think a thing, and then we act upon it, and then we create the thing, it manifests, and so on. Every single thing that you're looking at, eating, touching, sitting on, whatever it is, has come from an idea in the mind. We also call the creator the universal mind, because everything has to be thought into being from the creator. God thinks and then creates, and that's how it works. Well, please, in the future, we would love to hear more about the divine source of inspiration through our dreams and the world mm. of imagination in our dreams. You're helping us re-envision this world and help us recreate our realities by listening to those things in our dreams. Please thank educate you. us more, Yvonne. Oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I'll do my best. It's a huge subject, and I doubt there's one person ever has been able to figure everything out. Right. But, yes, we know some ways of um, interpreting our dreams, and, and that's been a huge help to me, really. And each one of us has our own individual dictionary of meanings that we've acquired throughout our lives. From very early childhood onwards, we have lived lives which the dream world will use, our sort of subconscious or your spirit will use, to create the dream around you so that you understand it once you understand the symbology of it all. Well, you've been a great bridge for us between our realities and that other world of dreams. Thank you. And, uh, we look forward to chatting more with you, Yvonne. Thank you, and I look forward to it too, Chris. Reimagine That with Chris Mann was brought to you by Retroality TV. Copyright 2011 by Chris Mann. You can find us at retroality.tv and at reimaginethat.libsyn.com. Tweet us at Retroality TV or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Retroality TV. And don't forget to check out our TV channel at youtube.com slash Retroality TV. And remember, no matter what challenges you face, no matter how many times life seems determined to throw roadblocks in your path, it always helps to put things into perspective. At least you'll never have to face as much death-defying adversity as Lassie.